us today. I'm going to ask you to be turning back over in your Bibles to Habakkuk as we'll continue our study there. Uh, I'm going to ask you to be praying with me today. Uh, if there's things on your heart today. Maybe you give them to God during this time of prayer that we have together. And most importantly, Lord, that he would be magnified in the things that we say and do through our services. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for being so faithful. Lord, we praise you for today. We thank you for being able to be together in this time. We praise you, God, for those who are at home today that still can be a part of the worship services of New Testament Christian Church. We're seeing a great number of people being able to do that. But we thank you, God, that we can bring all the cares of our life to you and the things that you've laid on our hearts that we need to be lifting up. We do that in this time. Most importantly, Father, we just want to be in your word and allow it to speak to us. May you do that, and may we receive the things that you want us to have. Lord, we're the ones need changing, not you. The Bible reminds us that you are a never-changing God. So, Father, help us to be more like you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're continuing our study of Habakkuk. We're going to be in chapter 2 today. And today's title of the message is one probably that most of you would be thinking along the lines as we've been looking at things that have taken place in our society over the last, oh gracious, decade. Uh, my time in ministry, I've often heard people uh, ask me things like, Preacher, do you think this is the end? Are we in the end days? We've already discussed that. Yes, we are in those last days. There's no way around it. Uh, the Bible told us, as we read, that uh, from the time Jesus ascended into heaven, the last days began. Now, how close we are, we don't know. But I know we're a lot closer today than we were yesterday. But I know something else is coming, and that's judgment. And so this is going to be a two-part message entitled, Judgment is Coming. Uh, what comes down to it is, is uh, a lot of us make decisions and choices in life. And as we make those choices every day, those choices will ev inevitably make us. The kind of person you are today is shaped by the choices that you've made in your life in times past. Many of those decisions probably at the time seem very small. And the culmination of those make up the total person and who we are. But some of those choices that we make in our life are going to be very momentous choices that we're going to make. They're going to be big things. Uh, they're going to be the ones that are going to be, I'm going to choose to ask this woman to marry me and spend the next 30 years married to her and the rest of my life. They're going to be those times where we're going to choose to start a family and have children, and they're going to shape who we are. They're going to be those times in our life where we're going to change careers and hopefully advance ourselves. They're going to be that most important decision we're ever making in our life when we're uh, attending a worship service or we are praying as we're reading God's Word and, and it touches our lives and we, des we decide to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And as a result of that, our eternity is changed. Momentous decisions that would be made. And so the choices and decisions you make can change the course of your life. Moses told the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. In other words, there are two ways that you can go. There's going to be two choices you can make. Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, that's true for all of us. No one is going to be exempt. We're all making a choice, either the broad way or the narrow way. In today's world, we see so many people taking the broad way. You know what the broad way is? It's the path of least resistance. We've traveled some in our time. And as we've traveled in certain parts of the country, especially up in the Northeast, you come to toll booths. Have you ever went through a toll booth? And as you're traveling, you're going down your road. Maybe it's two lanes, three lanes, four lanes, maybe even six. And all of a sudden, it just opens up. And there are 25 stalls that looks like you can drive through. And as you go through those terminals, now what have you got to do? You say, well, I'm going to go over here because there's nobody there. Well, guess what happens when you get way over there? Now you've got to get way back over here to get back on track when you come through the toll booth. And life is that way. Sometimes we see the path of least resistance, and we decide 
that we're going to go the easiest place to get to in that moment. The problem we run into when we come out of that moment, the path of least resistance may have been the hardest place that we had to be and we found ourselves in. And so God says there's going to be two ways you can go. You can go to Broadway that will lead to destruction, or you can go to narrow way that will lead to life, as Jesus says, and only a few will find it. And I think the biggest decisions you will ever make is, is to have yourself choose to walk a, a walk of faith in Christ Jesus, whether you're going to be your own God or not. Too many of us want to make our choices whether we're going to be God of our life. We like to make choices. Don't get me wrong. We all love to be able to make choices for what we want to do. Maybe today you're sitting here and you say, well, I think today for lunch after church, I want a banana sandwich. Others say, no, I think I want to go to the steakhouse. For some others say, I'm going to fast today and pray over the things the preacher has shared with me as I've been reading God's word. We never know what our choices will be, but we know they can affect the outcome of our life. Our choices really do mold us. And when adversity comes our way, we find out what kind of person we really are. I mean, what do we really believe in, and where does our faith truly lie? That's where Habakkuk finds himself today as we're getting ready to get back in the, the, the book. And, you know, he, he, Habakkuk looks at his country, and he sees the corruption. He sees the wickedness that's going on. He sees the abuse of power, the evil that is all around him. And the good people who have chosen to follow God, they are being abused by uh, people who are choosing a wicked path of life, and they're rejecting God. And so Habakkuk prays, as we mentioned in chapter 1, God, how long is it going to be before you answer our prayers and, and judge the wickedness that is all around us? And why haven't you already brought judgment on those who are doing such wicked things in your eyes? Then in chapter 1, God answers them, and he says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. They're a wicked group of people. I'm going to allow them to come in and overrun you because you're choosing wickedness. So I want you to understand how the fullness of wickedness can really look like, and I'm going to let them bring my judgment. I'm not causing them to do it, but I will allow them to do it. They're going around through all the land, and they're overrunning people. They're taking over. They're killing people. They're taking their property. They're you know, consuming their, their lands, and then they're carrying others off into exile. And guess what's going to happen? That's going to happen to Judah, right where you are, Habakkuk. You've been asking, and this is what's going to take place. Habakkuk has a hard time understanding that, so he asks some tough questions. You know, how could you do such a thing? Why are more righteous people, such as ourselves, being judged by the Babylonians? Why are you even using them to judge us? And how long will this judgment last? But then he says these words, as we looked at last week, I'll sit on a watchtower and wait for your answer, Lord. And so in chapter 2 is where we find ourselves. God's going to respond to Habakkuk's questions. The first thing we find is there's going to be a charge given to him. We read in verses, uh, verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. He says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me. And what answer I am to give to this complaint. The Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Uh, though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. And so God's answer for Habakkuk's question is going to be this. It's going to show up. You just wait in due time. And I believe there's something else for us in this charge for you and I today. And that is that God's going to help us understand that he's always still going to be in control. He's got two things he will share with us in this charge. First of all, he wants to understand that there's a warning to be shared. I think for most of us as preachers, we have kind of taken the easy road in preaching over the last 20 or 30 years. We, we preach things that don't make people feel uncomfortable. After all, we would not want people not to show up for church. We wouldn't want you to tune in from home and, 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 and not tune in because you didn't like what you heard. So we're going to tell you maybe what you would like to hear. It's easier and more palatable for you. So you can say, I really enjoyed church today. I will look forward to going back next week because I really enjoyed church. It's a good place. It's almost like Disney World in my town. It's got the most functions. It's got the most things going on. Whatever the case, we want to make things easy on ourselves. 
We're all like that, aren't we? And preachers have been guilty of it. Those who are the most popular to the ones who are probably setting in the most obscure little country churches around our nation. And they're just trying to preach the gospel, but they want to make it in such a, an attractive way. You know, my wife was with my daughter yesterday, and they went uh, wedding gown shopping. And the lady come in, and she says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. And as she put on this particular gown, trying to make the sale, close your eyes. And I want you to envision, talking to my daughter, your dad walking you down the aisle. And she places this veil over her. She gets her all dressed up in it. And she, she, she paints for her a picture in her mind of what her, her day is going to be like when she gets married. And she gets it all ready. And then she says, now open your eyes. What you've done is you've envisioned what you really want. And now it's come to fruition in just that one glimpse in a mirror. And I think a lot of us are that way, aren't we? We want to tell people, envision this. Envision a God who loves you. Jesus loves you. He went to a cross. He, he sacrificed himself for you. He took on the penalty that you deserve so that you could go to heaven. I want you to close your eyes and envision just how wonderful heaven's going to be. I want you to think about all the wonderful blessings that are waiting for you when you get there as you sit before the Lord and you just... Now open your eyes and see it come to fruition. And what happens for us as Christians is often we fail to see the warning signs of sin in our life because we've got so fixed on that, we don't pay attention to the things that are going on in our life. And God says what happens is you begin to be pulled away and going in a different direction from what you really were envisioned. So here we find a warning to share. He says, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. You know, in other words, don't put it on something that's going to fade away too quick because it needs to be there. Uh, you know, you've got to go tell people what I'm about to say, and, and it needs to be able to be ran with, if need be, and shared with other people. God doesn't want us to have a secret message that only a few people can know. He wants everybody to understand what's getting ready to take place. His message is for everyone, and the same is true today. We, we have this warning to share. We're, we're supposed to run with it. We're supposed to tell people about the gospel of Jesus and how he died for us and how he wants to set them free from sin. But the only way that we can have a fullness of who Jesus is is to walk away from that sin, not stay in that sin. And the Bible tells us that there's going to come a day when we will all face this judgment. And we need to be ready for it. You know, we can't soft pedal a nice, soft, comfortable grace and not help people understand that there's a wrath of God that we will all face. Do you have a warning to share? A warning of God's judgment on the wicked? Church, we must stop being scared to speak the truth in love. You know, when you confront people's sin, it's not always going to be easy. A friend of mine named Phil Sutton lives out in Bozeman, Montana. Phil's a down-to-earth type preacher. He just says little things and just cuts right to the heart of the matter in love. He, he mentioned this past week on Facebook about Christ-like and the way the word's used so often. He says, you know, we'll often say things like, what would Jesus do? And we envision what Christ-like would be in that moment. But you know what he said? Being Christ-like got Jesus crucified. Being Christ-like got Jesus crucified. Because he spoke the truth in love, he loved everybody, but yet he had to confront the very wickedness that was going on in the world around him. And you and I will be, have to do the same thing. There'll be some times where people will be offended because we speak the truth. Not harshly, but simply tell the truth. If you tell your kids to do something because it's for their own good, they get offended by it. Amen? Why? Because they don't want to do it. But we know it's for their own good. We need to warn people that Judgment Day is coming. We need to be able to tell people they need to make the right choice and follow Jesus before it's too late when he comes back. So the second part of this charge is to be patient and keep the faith. In verse 3 it says, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It certainly will come and will not delay. Now Habakkuk knows that God is not going to totally destroy his people because the Messiah still hasn't come at that point. He knows God's still going to fulfill his promise. 
And, and so even though these Babylonians are going to come in and it's not going to be good, God's still going to reserve some, and it's going to be through those he's going to carry off into exile and, and that the Messiah would eventually come. And when God says that appointed time is going to come, it will take place just as he said it would. They aren't going to get away with their evil when he's speaking of the Babylonians. He says, they're going to come. They're going to exact my judgment. That's what the people are going to But don't worry. I will judge them as well. So God tells Habakkuk, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through a difficult time. It's going to seem like forever, but eventually I'm going to bring you through it. You just wait for it. And you trust me. And when you're suffering and when you're praying for God to do something, sometimes it just seems like it just takes forever, doesn't it? You start to lose hope and maybe even you wonder if he's even listening to you. Does he really even care about you? You know, some people had that philosophy about God. He's too big. He's too powerful. He's way up there and he doesn't want to be involved in my little life. But God says, I even know the hairs on your head. Jesus mentioned, he says, are not two sparrow sold for a penny, but yet even when one of them falls to the ground, God knows what's going on with them. He says, aren't you more valuable than they are? And so he gives us this charge. God reminds us, I'm in control. I'm working a plan. One day at just the right time, I'm going to make everything right. So we are given this charge. We just need to be willing to share that God has got judgment coming. And that we need to be patient and keep the faith and wait for it to come. And then he's going to make this contrast in verse 4. It says, see, he is puffed up. He desires, his desires are not upright, for the righteous will live by faith. Now, the proud one he's speaking of here is the Babylonians, the worldly system of things that are going on around them. They just get consumed. They, they're going to attack uh, Judah. The righteous are those who follow God. So let's look at those. First of all, let's look at the righteous one. It says, but the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Maybe you're asking, well, who is righteous? Well, the righteous person who is the one who is right with God. He's right with the Lord. They're trying to live out their life by faith. They're trying to do everything they can by faith and through faith. And they want to go say, God, here I am. I don't know exactly everything you want, but here I am. Let me see you and know you. And because they believe in him, they obey and they trust the Lord. Now, what do you do when things are not going your way? I mean, what do you do when the enemy attacks you? Well, you trust God. What do you do when your home is destroyed like the nation of Judah was? You have to trust God. What do you do when the army is going to carry you into exile? You trust God. What do you do when the enemy is going to spread lies about you? You have to trust God. What do you do when the doctor says that your loved one is not going to make it. It will not recover. You still trust God. You know, you have to submit yourself to God. Because the Bible says the righteous live by faith. You know, those are the words that the most recently appointed justice of the Supreme Court, Miss Amy Coney Barrett, are going to have to remember in the coming days and, and the years of her life. When she was addressing the graduating class of Notre Dame, uh, and at law school in 2006, she encouraged the up-and-coming lawyers with these words. But if you can keep in mind that your fundamental purpose in life is not to be a lawyer, but to know, love, and serve God, you truly will be a different kind of lawyer. And she had to face all kinds of difficult questions and an onslaught of accusations and even lies against her. But the righteous live by faith. And you need to be, do as we have before, pray that she doesn't compromise God's truth for the sake of political or personal gain because that's when things get difficult in our life, isn't it? When we want to go for things that are going to be just right for us in this moment. When we just want to see, go for things that are going to make my life better. Guess what happens? We begin to go downhill because we begin to compromise and we begin to sacrifice the truths of God. So the righteous person bends their knee to God and submits themselves to his lordship and not the lordship of the world around them. Now, you contrast that with the proud person or the proud one. It says in chapter 2, verse 4, the beginning part of that, says, see, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. The proud one doesn't bend his knee to God or anybody else. They are their own God. And his soul is not right with him because his, he wants to be his own God. 
and so his soul is warped. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 5 says, Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is, not, he is as greedy as the grave, and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. The Bible doesn't say we can't drink alcohol, but there are so many references to drinking being a bad thing, and here's one of them right here. It says here drinking is connected with pride and greed. We overcome ourselves. Why? Because often we don't have right judgment when we fall into the trap of alcohol. The Bible says here the Babylonians are never satisfied. They take land from their neighbors, but they always want more. They're never going to be satisfied. There's never going to be enough. That's the old saying, isn't it? When is enough is enough? Well, we never know because we never have enough. And who determines when enough is enough? I do. In my life, I have to get determined when enough will be enough. You know, for the millionaire, maybe two million will be enough. But a person like me who is not a millionaire say, you know what? If I could become a millionaire, I could take that money and invest it and put it here. I could do that with it, and I would be satisfied. But you know what? The person who has his one says, now I need two. And the one that has two says, I need four. And the one that has four says, I need eight. And it could go on and on and on, couldn't it? We have to be careful that we don't let the things in the world overshadow the things of God in our life. It reminds me of people today who are never satisfied. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm just not very happy in my relationship. Maybe a, maybe a new boyfriend or girlfriend will make me happy. But they're not going to be satisfied with that. Or, or maybe a new suit of clothes, would that'll be it. People have got, we want to testify in here today of, of how many people have got clothes hanging in your closet that still have the tag on them and have been there for a long time that you've never even worn. But maybe one more would be good. Maybe this will be the one that I like when I walk into the next department store. I can't live without this. You understand how it goes? We are never satisfied. Maybe a better job. Maybe uh, another dollar, as we mentioned. Maybe an extra vacation. Maybe, well, maybe we're going to try to self-medicate with some pills or drink. Or maybe a little fling on the side. That will satisfy me. You gather all these pleasures to yourself, thinking that they will satisfy, but you always want more. The 17th century philosopher Pascal wrote these words, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. And if you're struggling today with satisfaction and being content with things in life, it may be that you have not filled that vacuum. It could be that you're struggling with something in your life because you haven't allowed Jesus to come into your life and to fill that void that you're struggling with. God points at the Babylonians who are constantly trying to fill that hole through conquest, and yet they're never satisfied. And as we'll see next week, he's going to promise this judgment will show up. In the meantime, what can you and I do? Well, if we're followers of Jesus, we must remember our charge to warn other people of God's impending judgment for unfaithfulness and be willing to share the truth and love so that people will know Jesus and escape such harsh judgment. We need to also remain faithful and trust God to fulfill the promise that he has given us that he would deliver us through these difficult days that we face. But still for others, maybe today you're faced with the fact that your pride has kept you from being right with God because you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've tried to be your own God. I'm too good for this. I, I don't think I really need this. I come to church. Isn't that good enough? And I can't tell you the number of funerals that I have preached now in my years of being in ministry of people who attended church who sat there week in and week out, who attended all the functions, who even pitched in and gave a hand with the different things that went on, whether it be cooking or serving in some way. And yet, when I had personal conversation with them, they had never made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. They thought going to church was going to be good enough. I had one man one time even tell me, when I asked him, I said, have you ever made your profession of faith? Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And he said these words. I come to church here more than a lot of these other people who say they're Christians. I think I'm as good as they are. And I told him, I said, yet the Bible says 
that none is righteous. No, not one. And it is only through the blood of Jesus coming in our life and washing us what will cleanse us. It's the only thing that's going to separate us from heaven and hell is our choice whether we will follow Jesus or we will choose to reject him. And so our church attendance will not save us. It helps prepare us for the part about being receiving of Christ that we can learn and grow in him, but simply showing up and sitting in a church service somewhere did not save us because it's simply a righteous act. But it does not save us because we need a relationship with Jesus. And he said these words. He said, well, maybe I won't go to heaven then. That's a hard choice to make, isn't it? When you find somebody that will tell you, I'm not going to heaven. I'm going to take my chances. People do it every day, don't they? People make a choice every day when they get ready to do whatever it is they're doing. Will they will take their own life in their hands or will they will not? We need to be ready to face Jesus. So today's the day, if you have never accepted Christ, that you can make him your personal Savior. You need to simply say, God, today I'm just going to accept you. I want to... I want what you want for my life. I want to give up my pride, and I want to humbly bow before you, asking your forgiveness, because that's what I need in my life. I know you can cleanse me. I've tried everything, and it's not working. So let me just feel your grace and your mercy. And though I deserve judgment, I, I want to receive life and blessing in your name. And today, God, I surrender myself to you. And if I need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of my sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit, I will do that because I want to know that I am right. All oh, my dear friends, judgment is coming. The choice is whether we will face it with Jesus or we'll face it without him. When we face it with Jesus, he's got us covered. When we face it without him, we're on our own. As our worship team comes and lead us in our final song, maybe you've got a decision to make. I'm going to be praying for us as we prepare in this time. and Maybe God will lead our hearts to be who he wants us to be. Let's pray together. Father, we're honored, Lord, today that we get to come into your house. Thank you, God. We recognize there's a pandemic going on. We're hearing about upticks in numbers of cases in different places, even our own local area. Yet, Lord, we praise you for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, God, for opportunities for those who are today uh, watching online with us, that they can have this opportunity to worship the risen Savior. Thank you, God, that as we look forward to what's coming one day, we're going to see it from the side of being a follower of Jesus. We're going to see it for a, a person who would know Christ and to be able to walk with Christ and, and who has trusted you when we couldn't trust ourselves. So today, as we're having this time, as we make these decisions, Lord, help us be prepared to be fully in a right relationship with you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.